find people to mute to mute so, themselves. Yeah. Elder in the Yeah, you can mute. Hey. Did it go, Sally? Yes. Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to the Great Old Broads for Wilderness, Broads at the Border, Border Wall webinar. And first, I just want to remind everyone to mute yourselves unless you, um, until we have question and answers. And also, please mute your phones. Uh, but I want to give a grand welcome to all of our constituents across the country. And also a big thanks to Sally Sharp, who is with us today from the Great Old Broads of the Wilderness um, staff in Durango. And um, also a oh, welcome and thanks to our guest speakers. Sally is gonna be a speaker. And then also we will have Miles Traphagen, who is the yeah. Borderlands Program Coordinator for Wildlands Network in Tucson. And Kate Scott, who along with her husband, Tony Heath, are co-owners of the Madrian Archipelago Borderlands Program near Sierra Vista in southeastern Arizona. Uh, the purpose of our broad trip to the border was to assist the Borderlands Coalition organization, environmental organization in mapping out sections of the border wall. Um, I do need to ask everyone to please mute themselves. I think I hear some, some, some noise. Mm -hmm. And we'll be all be able to hear better if we can mute. Thank you. Anyway, yeah, so we, we wanted to assist the Borderlands Coalition organizations in mapping the border wall to see what is actually going on there and to help determine priority areas for where wildlife corridors are, where the biggest um, environmental destruction is, and also for areas for possible takedown in the future. And we also wanted to be the boots on the ground to share exactly an eyewitness evidence for what's going on with the border wall for our constituents across the country who may not be able to visit for themselves. Some overview of what's going on is that uh, in the last two years of the Trump administration, over 450 miles of the wall was built. Uh, much of that, about 400 or so, was replacement wall, and that was replacing mostly vehicle barriers. But there was at least 50 new, miles of new wall built also, and much of that was in Arizona. That means that the wildlife ha habitat has been destroyed in many areas. And even though humans have devised amazing and ingenious ways to go over, under, or even through the wall, the wildlife, for the most part, can't. Their their habitat has been just just cut in half for their half for their um, their breeding and their feeding areas, and at least ninety three endangered species in the area are at further peril. Another problem is groundwater pumping <clears throat> to you use to to build the wall. Um, construction companies have been using uh, groundwater to mix for cement to put the bollards in. And also I've seen where trucks have been driving along the dirt roads they've built and spraying water out on them just simply to keep down the dust. So also, uh, also uh, several um, freshwater springs like Quito Paquito in Organ Pipe National Monument have been affected very severely because of this construction two rivers and numerous washes with only ephemeral water, which is a major portion of the water in Arizona, have been affected in this time of drought and climate change. So this all sounds very dire and it is, but uh, we will also have some, some hope and some sharing of what we can do at the end of this talk. Um, there's some new things happening in the administration and we'll have some advocacy points, which Sally will, will tell us. But right now I'd like to start with the broads. After that, we'll have our guest speakers and our question and answer. And the next, the first broad up is Jenny. So please take it over. Um, oh, this, I just wanna interject. Thank you, Kate. This is for camping on Kate's uh, land and we had a great time there. Okay, Jenny, take it away. Hi, I'm Jenny Cobb, you have a Pine Prescott broadband leader. We're going to visit the pretty and peaceful San Pedro River, 
which is the last undammed free-flowing river in the entire Southwest that still hosts substantial acreages of riparian forest. The river flows north from Mexico near Hereford, Arizona. Next. From our research before arriving, the finished wall was complete to the east and to the west in 2020, but the wall of the river still consisted of a vehicle barrier. In the bottom slide, oh, it's in the top on here, they're preparing for construction and cut down several of the magnificent cottonwood trees to stumps and plow a swatch of land for the upcoming bridge and the wall. Next. We parked at a friend of Kate's about a half a mile from the river and were greeted by this obviously handmade sign. We did not keep out. You can see us in the photo walking towards the wall. This is public land. The section of border wall at the San Pedro River is part of a riparian area consisting of 57,000 acres or about 40 miles of the upper river, which was designated as a national conservation area by Congress in 1988. The primary purpose is to protect, enhance, and conserve the desert riparian ecosystem. Next. We walked along the border wall from the west approaching the river. There was a lot of debris along the way on the north side of the road, which was left after construction. Next. This is what we found at the river, a concrete bridge and large sharp rocks extending through the riparian area for about a quarter of a mile. They were hard to walk through and it would be easy to turn an ankle or even worse. Next. Someone said it resembles a fortress with massive floodgates, a concrete bridge and light poles that tower over the riverbed. The walls are made from 30 foot tall steel walls, they're called bollards, sitting in a foundation several feet deep that's filled with concrete and rebar. They're six feet wide and separated by four, uh, four inch separation between the, the, the way, rails there and you can see through. The gates on the wall across the river are designed to allow water to flow through the wall when opened. There are 66 heavy steel gates with locks that were originally welded together. Miles noticed the gates in the wall were welded shut and posted photos online. As a result, the temporary tack welds were removed. But who will open the gates and how quickly in the event of potential flooding? The huge locks require specialized mach machinery to unlock them manually. Next. Oh, Barbara is sitting here in the concrete. The extensive concrete will supposedly keep the foundation from being destroyed in the event of flooding. Next. So we're brought here at the river and the border wall. The river survived the construction of the 30 foot walls, but there are major consequences. The first being for wildlife, which depends on the important riparian area for water, migration, and food sources. And secondly, there is a great potential for environmental damage in the event of monsoon flooding. As Emily mentioned, over 40 environmental laws were waived to build the wall. The fence was designed to prevent vehicles and pedestrians from crossing. However, there was little or no consideration for erosion, flooding, destroying wildlife migration corridors, and fragmenting wildlife habitat. Next. There was one gate open when we were there, but it is backed up with two rows of barbed wire fencing. So wildlife, small or large, journeying north and south comes upon an impenetrable barrier. They cannot cross the border here with a 30 foot wall that's set in concrete and they cannot even come across in the waterway with the two rows of dense barbed wire. Next. 
Oh, this is frightening. Typically in Mexico and Arizona, there are monsoon thunderstorms that can occur from mid-June through the end of September. The rains might not occur every day, but in bursts, opening up a great potential for flooding. So now close your eyes and imagine a torrent of debris laden water racing towards the border wall. Danger, danger. There is no advance warning system for monsoon thunderstorms creating a flood stage in the river. So who's gonna open the 66 gates? Can they be open before the flood reaches the border wall? It would be too late if the river reaches the border. Without the gates open, debris such as trees and boulders could be swept against the wall. And the building uh, uh, pressure could collapse the bollards and send a rush of water and debris down the river. Water levels in the past have reached as high as 17 feet, uh, according to a nearby USGS survey gauge. So we are only guessing about potential damage if the gates are not open. In fact, the designs for the gates were never reviewed for environmental impact. We are completely in the dark as to the damage that most certainly will occur in this fragile ecosystem. Next. After our visit to the border at the San Pedro River, Rods has seen firsthand that it is imperative that the wall be removed here. There are no environmental safeguards or mitigation plans to prevent environmental destruction. We must recover critical riparian habitat for wildlife who need this corridor. Oh, here we are on Kate and Tony's ranch and Broads are devoted to our advocacy, but we always find time for fun. The truck wagon is open. Dinner is on. Our next speaker is Ross Switzer. Thank you, Jenny. You're welcome. <clears throat> hey, I'm Ross Switzer. I'm the middle Gila broadband leader out of Florence, Arizona, and I'm also co-leader in Amelie Sonoran Broadband. So here we are on the west side of the Huachuca Mountains, and in front of us, you see a road zigzagging up the mountain. Um, there's five switchbacks that are visible there. And you'll notice that we're walking by an older section of wall. This is called Normandy Barrier. And Normandy Barrier was designed to stop vehicle traffic, but wildlife can still get through this older wall. So these mountainous regions um, in Arizona are a vast connected expanse of habitat for many species. Uh, much of Arizona and New Mexico is prime jaguar habitat, and a few jaguars have reestablished residence in the U.S. over the years. Mexican gray wolves can be found both on the United States side and the Mexico side. And in fact, in January, a one-year-old wolf dispersed from Mexico and he entered the U.S. Unfortunately, he was killed crossing I-10 in eastern Arizona, but it does show that species are still attempting to follow their migration pathways. So we definitely need to keep these wildlife corridors open and we need to restore those that have been damaged. Next. So as we walked up the road, uh, you could see the road is deeply cut and wide. Uh, this large graded road climbs the mountain for the sole purpose of providing access so that a, a new bollard wall can be built straight as an arrow up the international uh, border. And throughout all these photos being presented today, I do want you to notice one thing, and that is how massive this construction is. The construction zone is not limited to this small strip near the wall, um, but it has, it has destroyed substantial swaths of habitat. Next. So at the sixth switchback, uh, the road straightened, it dipped down and it climbed again to the top of the mountain and a surprise awaited us there. Uh, there was a 700 foot section of new bollard wall at the top and an open trenching that you can see here with rebar awaiting more sections. <clears throat> so that orphan wall is currently attached to nothing. Next. So this is a view from the top looking down at the orphan wall. Um, of course, these walls don't stop our ingenious human species from crossing, but it does stop the wildlife. 
Uh, the very last baller to the West was spray painted with a date of January 20th, of course, 2021, inauguration day for the new administration. So this was a last in your face gift from one of our contractors. And we do have documented evidence that construction did continue illegally uh, along the border until mid-February. Next. So here we are at the top of the mountain, you see the orphan wall, and I want you to notice the boundary monument number 102. Um, these obelisks were originally erected between 1849 through 1857, and they, and they were erected to mark the international boundary. So the interesting thing was on the hike up the mountain, uh, we saw the progression of how our country has delineated the international border with Mexico. So originally you had these boundary markers and then you had the barbed wire, which was to keep cows in. We all know what barbed wire is for. Um, we had the Normandy fence, which was to stop vehicles. And now we've moved to this impenetrable uh, bollard wall. Next. Now across from the boundary monument number 102, you see this park bench sitting atop a knoll. And this is the southern terminus of the 800 mile Arizona Trail. I don't know if any of you have hiked down there, but this is what it looks like now. Um, in the past, you would have sat there and you would have soaked in the expansive views of the beautiful mountains in Mexico beyond. But now your vista is marred by this orphan wall, and it could be entirely blocked if construction is allowed to continue. Next. So as we all know, broads work hard and we play hard too. And here we are uh, straddling a section of older barrier and we have one foot in each country. So I'll pass it on to Barb. Thank you, Rod. Barb, you're on mute. Can you unmute yourself? Thank yep. you. Sorry, didn't know. That's okay. This is this is Barbara Jacobson. I am co-leader of Yavapai Prescott Broad Broadband as well. And we had the opportunity to go with a humanitarian group and to hike into Walker Canyon near Nogales. It's a lovely riparian canyon. You can see as we walked along, we were carrying 10 or 20 or 30 pounds of water each and a little bit of food to leave at the border when we walk through. And there is evidence of creatures that live there as well as humans. Next. The water was placed at times along the way in boxes marked and that protects it for human use from critters that might wanna nibble on it. And I want you to keep in mind this picture of this huge steel used to be an old water tank, probably at least five feet by 10 feet by 12 feet that had flowed downstream two miles. So consider the amount of water that needed to carry this downstream a couple of years ago for two miles. Next. As we went further on, we saw a lot of destruction starting. We weren't even to the border yet and hills, mountains were being torn down. Looks like to create a roadway along where they were gonna build the wall up there. And on either side of this destruction were these culvert pipes about um, 10 of them, 13 inches across. Now, my question was, how was this engineered and is this a good idea? I, having lived in Arizona all these years, cannot imagine the floodwaters going through these little pipes and not uh, um, also washing out this loose dirt that's up there. Next. And this is the steepness, if you can imagine, I think Kate walked up there, the steepness of this hill that they were tearing down. And on the other side, they were doing the same thing to kind of create a flatter place to put the wall. Again, the wall was not here, however. Next. A few hundred yards down, we were able to find the border. And water bottles are placed there as some food for migrants coming across in the area. And, and, and what's evident too is some of the bottles were used, some weren't. Um, next. And the, the Tucson um, Samaritans write on the bottles and ask them not to be destroyed, which is a really good thing. Um, I began to wonder is what right do we have to blockade the land? 
further in from the border, there is the blockade starting. And how can this nature come back? Next. I'm really grateful for all the many organizations that work to protect all creatures and we toast them all. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Sue is up next. Sue, can you unmute yourself, please? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'll start again. Hi, everybody. I'm Sue Libby, and I'm the co-leader of the Tucson uh, Broadband, along with uh, Fran Krakow. And the two of us traveled down for two days and met the rest of the group at the border. And the section that we drove along was the Patagonia foothills to the Santa Cruz River. So in the first slide, what we encountered were lots of these steel bollards uh, ready to stand up and be sunk into concrete. However, they had just been abandoned and left laying um, horizontal uh, the way you see them here, which effectively created a barrier without it being a legal barrier. I was told that's an illegal use of these bollards. Next slide. Now we kept running into these open trenches. These open trenches went on intermittently for miles and miles. When I first came upon one and looked down into it, uh, I was shocked as a person who is a former wildlife rehabilitation worker. My first thought was, oh, if an animal falls into here, there is no way for that animal to get out of this trench. These trenches are, were left open uh, when they stopped construction and they just are just standing there open today. Some of them have, uh, as you can see, raw rebar sticking up and some of them are just open trenches. In addition, I was told that the soil that the bollards are actually sunk into in this area is unstable crumbly volcanic ash. I'm not a geologist. I don't really know what that means, but it does not sound good. Next slide. Okay, we're going up into the Patagonia uh, foothills here. And to give you uh, the scale of the slide on the right, there's a teeny uh, black dot kind of toward the lower left of the, that slide. And that's actually Kate. I didn't realize it, it was pointed out to me. That's actually Kate walking there. So you can see how small she looks and how big the blasting and clearing area is. And on the left, you see the result of that blasting, boulders and rocks falling down into the ravines. Next slide. Okay, here's two views of the border wall as it is currently constructed. On the left, uh, I'm going to point out that on the US side, um, the tops of the border wall is completely covered with concertina razor wire, which is the most deadly kind of razor wire uh, and will stop anything from flying through or climbing over, which I guess is the purpose. And on the right, uh, the slide here shows the view from the United States over into the Mexican side. And you can see all the vegetation on the Mexican side, whereas uh, we've wiped it out on the American side for quite a distance. Next slide. I should also mention before I, I talk about this last slide, if you look at the concertina uh, razor wire on the top, um, that, that effectively stops a lot of migrating birds that cannot fly that high. One such species is the ferruginous pygmy owl, which can only fly to a flight of about 13 feet. Um, in addition to it being limited in flight, there are very few of these animals left. Uh, it's estimated there are only about 41 of them left in Arizona. And the Mexican side, they're estimating a couple of dozen. Essentially, they can no longer fly back and forth to exchange genetic material, and this could possibly um, make them, uh, you know, cause inbreeding and, and make them die out, the few that are left. 
Okay, this slide here uh, is the end of the day for us, one of the days, and we are holding up wolf uh, silhouettes in honor and uh, as an homage to the endangered Mexican gray wolf. And we ended that day with a big loud howl for the wolves. Next slide. Okay, the next day we went to the Pajarito Mountains and on the left, lower left there, you can see a border patrol. We were met by the border patrol. Uh, our goal had been uh, to continue up that road and you can see right at the top on the right-hand side, kind of the top of a crane. Um, that actually is a staging area for Fisher Sand and Gravel, one of the main contractors for this border wall. Uh, we were stopped by the border patrol and we asked them, could we go up there? And they said, no. Uh, and we said, well, you know, this is a public road, right? Because the broads usually try to, you know, argue creatively with people. And he said, yes, it was a public road, but Fisher Sand and Gravel was currently leasing that property from the Forest Service, which uh, prevented us from going up there. Next slide. This was interesting. I happened to, to look up and along the top of, of the hills in the Pajarito foothills, uh, the bollards and the wall itself uh, is painted black. It looks kind of bluish in this slide, but they're actually painted black. And when I talked to the group and I said, I, I don't understand why, why this looks so different in this area. And I was told that at one point, President Trump um, had decided or been given advice that painting the top of the border wall black would actually make it hotter in the summer and harder to cross. And I said, hmm, that's an interesting story. Um, but then one of our, one of my uh, co-broads um, actually sent me the, the link and you can find the link in a Washington Post article of uh, May 6, 2020, where they actually talked about this incident. Next slide. And just, just to show everybody that, that we don't always rough it. I'm not a rougher myself. I'm, I'm not a, a big camper. Uh, here we are relaxing at uh, the B&B that we found uh, on the Southern border there. And it's the Corona Ranch B&B. Thank you very much. I believe Roz is going to carry on, right? Okay. Thank you, Sue. Mm -hmm. All righty. Well, we took the border road um, from the small town of Naco and we headed east toward Douglas. And the train there is rolling and it's defined by a series of dry washes. So this slide shows a border road bridge under construction across one of the larger washes in the area. And this bridge is actually a smaller version of the completed one that you viewed earlier crossing the San Pedro River. The border road through this section was well over the 60 foot legal limit. And we had, did find wide roads throughout the borderlands and had measured one at 110 feet a few days before. Next. Lighting is found along the border and you can see it was being laid in this section as well. In a year long study, uh, the Sky Island Alliance found that around 70% of the wildlife that they captured on their border trail cams uh, were nocturnal. So bright lights do confuse and disrupt these nocturnal animals and it impacts their movements and it impacts their ability to obtain food. Also when construction was halted, um, these, these areas uh, we're left in a dangerous condition. This section you can see had open rebar, excavated trenches, and actually unstable sections of the wall that um, that had to be braced just to remain standing. And we found this throughout all of our border travels that um, it it was just it was just left in horrible condition um, and dangerous condition. Next. So in some of the washes, 
those gates have been placed. Um, the series of gates that you see on the right-hand side is not going to be enough to handle the monsoon flooding when it occurs. But additionally, um, they've been blocked by the contractor. So there's a combination of concrete barriers and piles of dirt. So there is currently no way to even get these gates open when it rains. Uh, the block monsoon floods, they're going to hit this wall, they're going to eddy back into the washes, and they're going to create increasingly deep and wide arroyos uh, down the washes. So the habitat destruction is inevitable. Um, one thing to keep in mind if you're not used to the desert is in the desert, Ephemeral water, which is the intermittent water that occurs through rainfall, actually makes up around 95% of Arizona's stream miles. So these dry washes are the lifeblood of the desert. The flora and fauna have adapted to these periods of flooding and, and drought. And these washes absolutely have to be op opened up so that the ecosystem can function as it was intended. Next. So we're gonna move on to our next day at the border with Emily, Kate, myself, and Rosie. Rosie is my trusty ex Tara who took us everywhere. And I named her after Rosie the Riveter because we can do it. Thanks. Thank you, Roz. Yes, um, yeah, we can do it. And one of our last stops was in the Sasabi area in Southeastern Arizona. Um, it was with uh, Roz, myself, and, and Kate. And we came to this border wall in the small town of Sasabi and, and then turned east to follow the border wall. And as we traveled along the wall, uh, which went for miles and miles, we saw piles of old bollards in the upper left-hand photograph. And I believe that was from the Normandy style fences, the, the row, um, vehicle barriers that used to be there. And in the lower right, you can see the, the tall wall with the new ballards piled horizontally like Sue witnessed also in front of some gaps. And we saw several gaps as we continued down the road. I'm not sure why, if they were leaving them open for washes, but then why pile the bollards there? So I'm not sure what the plan had been for that. As we continued on, we stopped and looked through the wall and, and noticed um, one, this is just one of several bollard, or I'm sorry, um, obelisk style, border monuments from the 19th century, as Roz mentioned before. And then in the upper right, as we looked through the wall, we saw on the Mexican side, um, a, a nice sweet little chapel there. And also on the Mexican side in the bottom photograph, we saw evidence of migrants. And this is a broken water bottle uh, uh, left on the Mexican side. And I'm not sure, of course, what the, what the outcome of this migrants situation was. But the biggest surprise was we came across this really large staging area. And uh, we noticed that it was uh, Fisher Sand and Gravel, again, which seems to be the, the company that has been lingering around in most places. And you can see on the top picture there, to the left, there are gravel trucks. And on the right side of this mound of dirt, we have cement trucks. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, cement trucks. So they're still there. And this was a Saturday we were there. I, as I walked towards the area to make some photographs, I thought I'd be stopped because there were some people there, but, but for some reason, nobody stopped me. So I kept making pictures. Um, lower right-hand photograph here is uh, lighting that's used. And then in the lower right-hand corner, I took this picture because be a ways behind this staging area, you can see this tiny little knob. It's actually a large, it's a mountain, it's called Baba Kivari Peak, and it's a sacred to the indigenous tribes of the area. And I thought that was quite a contrast between this construction area and um, the sacred mountain in the, the background. <clears throat> Traveling further east, we came across a water tank, which was a portent of what was to come. This is one of two water tanks that we saw that looked like swimming pools. Um, we weren't sure where the water was coming from, if it was groundwater or spring water, which is possible because there is uh, vegetation behind it. But it's, it's made out of what looks like concrete and um, it's fenced off so that if you're an animal 
and you're dying of thirst, then you come across this and you can't get through to it unless maybe you're a bird or very, very, very small animal. Uh, and then there's the lifesaver and the jacket. So I'm not sure if that was to save people who might fall in or if it was just simply to do the job that they need to do pumping the water. <clears throat> Traveling on further east along the wall, it, was, it went for miles. Uh, we saw this mountain ahead and we weren't sure what it was. We looked it up and found it to be Kumero Mountain. And as we got close, we saw that, uh, we know we've heard that, that these mountains have been blasted, not just scraped, but blasted. And the, the photograph on the upper right has blasting cones, which is a proof that it's been blasted. And also to the left, the photograph on the left is a charred cactus falling down. The bottom photograph is also proof of mixing cement. It's a wrapper to cement. We uh, had to work our way around that mountain a little bit. And then um, where that area was, there was only the barbed wire fence. But then we came up against a new portion of the wall that started right after the mountain and it went for miles and miles and miles. We were not able to, to follow it all that day because we were running out of time. But um, we did see several sections that were gaps like this upper left-hand photograph. And there's on this, it looks like lights or cameras. I wasn't quite sure which it was or both perhaps. The good news is that we saw some, some animals, um, the deer here in the lower right-hand photograph. We saw several of those, some of them crossing the border through the gaps, which was great. So we're wondering if in some of those areas of the gaps where there are bollards piled in front, if we took them away, then all these animals would be able to get across. So, that's it for us broads <clears throat> speaking here. And I am going to hand it over now to, um, I think it's Sally. It's gonna go next and give us some, some pointers on what can be done. And I'll stop my screen share now. Um, so actually it's Kate. Okay. Um, if you can come on Kate and I'll show the video when you're ready. Okay. So I need to share my screen. Okay, I've stopped sharing. Okay, so, go ahead, Kate. Okay. Okay, well, greetings, love and light to you all in the four directions. Over the Memorial Day weekend, I coordinated and guided the University of California at Berkeley environmental planning grad students led by Professor Matt Condolf, a world-renowned hydrology expert. We went to Pajarito Mountain staging area, the San Pedro River, the San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge, and Guadalupe Canyon. My husband created a film for us to, so you can get an idea of what we went through a little bit. And we hope that with this critical pre-monsoon field analysis, that we will be able to inform and amplify the need for remediation and restoration funding to begin and soon. That's some sites that are not going to pull those down. And uh, so let's just be opportunistic and look at what we have. <clears throat> and then at a photo station like that, we can take more than one photo, more than one focal length, but just record all, everything for each photo. So that we can replicate the time of day and everything else. Do you have uh, some kind of GPS? Yes, so we do. Um, I, have, I have several types of GPS. Uh, on the left, just right tree or something. Yeah. yeah, well, there aren't many trees. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but if you can find a bedrock outcrop, uh -huh. then that would be a good place so to go. Far, around. That way. Like low? Yeah. You want to have a good idea. So we'll do the section. Maybe the baby will do that. Yeah, I guess it's what 
like they say, it feels a lot hot, hotter here in the old town. You know, like all the concrete and stuff. And at night it gets incredibly, it's like 65 yeah, degrees. Yeah. Because we're right now, we're, we'll, have the GPS like, we're, well, the floor is around 4,200. Uh, okay. What? Yeah. This amazes me. They're still bringing things in and out of here. Yeah, what is this? I, I don't know, but this is, this is really, out. really infuriating. Please do not be like that to me and I mean. Don't talk to me like that. I promise you I'll call the call tonight. And they'll ask for you right out. Anyway, I wanted to see people. Anyway, I wanted to thank you. Who gave us the combo? What is it? Who are you speaking with? Well, I can hold it up here. I'm a what? I know this isn't the wall right away. It's right there. Nice talking, yeah. He was gonna punch me. I'll tell you. He was. Anyway, we're not in there, but we're not in their space. That's what I'm trying to tell you. We're, we're, we're not. So. Okay. When I, when I walked over there, I thought I had water in here. Oh, so this road right here goes down. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 oh. We are here today at the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area with a team of scientists from the University of California at Berkeley who have come here specifically to conduct field analysis to the effects the border wall will have on our wildlife, migratory and our watershed area. Specifically now we're here at the San Pedro River, but they are also conducting studies at the San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge and Guadalupe Canyon. Kate, I'd like to just ask you one question. What's going to happen when the monsoon arrives in a couple of weeks? We've got serious drainage issues here and elsewhere. So, can you tell us a little bit about the San Pedro River, which way it runs, and what's likely to happen? Well, that is the big question, because none of the hydrology information was shared, and any of the plans that went into the design of this, we've already, the scientists have already said the gates are uh, in the wrong positions for the flows that will happen behind us, which is the major river channel. So um, we're expecting debris of, of cottonwoods in 30-foot lengths. These are 16-foot width gates. So a log jam could be imminent. So a dam, excessive water pressure behind the dam, and you can con conceive what uh, a 30-foot wall of steel and that weight crushing and rushing down the river. So, so, yeah, so you might say we're keeping our fingers crossed. 
with disaster possibly imminent Correct. in the coming weeks. Which is why it was topmost priority in my mind to bring them here prior to the monsoon. And we, they were gracious enough to do it right after they completed their analysis of this area and the other two areas I mentioned, as well as the Pajarito Mountain staging area west of Nogales. So we have earmarked key critical areas that could have torrential mudslides and flooding to, to degrees that we know have occurred in the past. And um, which will undermine the wall. Correct. Well, let's see. Professor, could you start? Just tell us your name, full name, what you're doing. Sure. Where, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so I'm uh, Matt Condal, a professor of environmental planning and geography. And uh, my, I and the three students, the students are from my environmental planning studio class. And one of the projects we did during the semester was looking at some of the environmental impacts of the construction of the new border wall. And uh, three of those students have come with me here to make some measurements. Today on the San Pedro, we're mostly looking at the, the gates that have been built to allow the uh, river to flow through and flood. And uh, we're measuring some of those gates, but we're also measuring the dimensions of the pieces of large wood that are carried by the San Pedro River in flood. And um, there's a nice piece right behind Tony here which we have to look at these and um, make the measurements and we get some idea of how easily they could pass through the gates that have been built for them. Thanks. Drew, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I understand you come from Alaska, but you went to college in Maine and now you're in California and you're working with, you're in graduate school. Yeah, I'm Drew Mueller. I'm an environmental planning student at UC Berkeley, and that's all true. Uh, it's pretty much my story. And I'm interested in the hydrology along the mm -hmm. border wall, and nice. it's been very interesting getting to see it in person. So uh, just tell me, what will you do next after this interview? You're going to you're going to mark some GPS, some locations, so that you can compare now with after the monsoon and to see what the difference is basically is that true yeah i think one of the next things we'll do is make a, a sketch of like the profile the cross section of the san pedro as where the border crosses it mm -hmm. and how the gates are situated along that cross section and how that relates to this bridge that right. also crosses it right Thank you, Kate. You're welcome. My pleasure. I hope they took that. 
a lot of uh, good information. It looks like they did. Yes, they did. And uh, next up we have, uh, is it Miles coming? Yeah, okay. Miles, uh, yeah, go ahead. Hello there. Thank you everybody for having me. And um, I just have to say that I'm really impressed with the work that you all have done. And it's, it shows a really strong level of commitment to the land and in our country and our environment. Wow. Can you hear? Uh, yeah, now we can, I think. Okay. Yeah, I just, I think you've done a wonderful job. And um, one thing I'll point out is that I saw that everybody was using photographs that had the latitude longitude in that. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say that's crucially important because over the last few years, a lot of people have been working on border wall issues, um, have taken photographs and says, oh, look at this, but we have no idea of knowing where it is. And so that documentation for historical reference and potentially restoration and legal purposes is really important. So keep on doing what you're doing. So thank you. Well, yeah, thank you, Miles, for showing us how to do that too. That was great training. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I've got a, a, a PowerPoint presentation and um, there's gonna be a little bit of overlap and um, a lot of the same images and same themes, but I think that underscores the fact that uh, we're all seeing the same thing and that if we're all identifying that, that there must be some truth to what we're all observing. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I guess I'll share a screen. And um, since we're on the topic of water flowing and rivers and uh, erosion and what's gonna happen, um, I have a, a one minute and 48 second video I took last year when our one rain came through the San Bernardino Valley. <laughs> um, and they, that shut the project down for four days because the roads were so slippery uh, that they couldn't work. And I just think like if we would have had even a normal monsoon last year, I'm guessing that they may not have even been able to get up to Guadalupe Canyon at that rate because it was pretty substantial. So, um, so I guess the share screen, we'll, um, we'll do this real quick video here. Okay. I'm at Silver Creek which is about 15 miles east of Douglas, Arizona, and two miles west of the San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge. And uh, we've had uh, a couple of inches of rain today, so we've had a flood event. And um, I just want to show you what water can do here. This is the structure that they have built that is going to um, somehow be part of the wall structure. A lot of water coming through here. This just came up in the last two hours. And what you see there in the foreground is the Normandy barrier. And there's a big chunk of it that's been pushed downstream. So you can really see the, the power of this water. And just within the last hour or so, the water was up fairly high. You can see the foam there. What's going to happen with this wall once they finally complete it and you get a rainfall event of four or five inches, which happens frequently here. This is our first major rainfall that we've had for the monsoon. So you're looking at a situation where the, the soil is not even saturated at this point. Um, once you reach saturated conditions, the runoff is going to be even greater and um, because, you know, a lot of this water is soaking into the ground now. So anyway, so that's what we're looking at there. Is in, and uh, it's a cloudy day today here in Arizona, and that's a nice thing. So, so let's get on. We're standing done. here at the border wall, oh, sorry about east that. of Sasabe, Arizona. Oh. So this is a 30-foot border wall that was constructed this last year and a half. Oh. And you'll often hear people say that things like birds, butterflies, miles. Okay, there we go. So we've okay. got. 
So I'll get on with this presentation here. So um, I'm going to focus on um, some very specifics of the border wall uh, and things that a lot of people hear in the media regarding uh, what it means for replacement fencing and pedestrian bollard vehicle, because I think it's important to know um, because people will probably question you um, for, you know, why, uh, why does it matter? And if it's just fence and replacement, what's the big deal? So are we able to see the PowerPoint now? Yes. Okay. So over the last um, uh, two years, really, and uh, since 2019 and up till the present, uh, there was about 450 miles of border wall built. And so that brings the amount of pedestrian fencing to about 760 miles. And so the red lines that you see here are where uh, pedestrian fence has been built. Uh, I'll go state by state. So the uh, red is the Trump border walls, and then the green is the pedestrian fencing that was here before. So you can see a lot of it has occurred largely uh, in the last couple of years. Miles, yep. your slideshow is not advancing. There you go. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. This is New Mexico, and you'll see that the east-west axis that goes from El Paso over to the corner of the boot heel is exactly 100 miles. It's actually like 99.6, and that's entirely walled off. And then down in the boot heel, the Playas Valley has been walled off, and the rest is vehicle barrier. In California, um, there's not very much open border at all. Um, it's there's a seven mile section in the Hacumba wilderness that you'll see that conspicuous gap uh, in the middle of the screen and a little bit in the Otay Mesa wilderness. But since then, uh, there's been more filled in since I made this map. <clears throat> um, Miles, we're still not seeing it advancing. Really? Okay. I'm not sure. Let's... Do you see the it advancing now? Um, I think so. Okay, New Mexico. No. California? Yeah, we see the whole map of mm -hmm. California, Arizona, and New Mexico, and Texas. Maybe you have to go to each one individually if it's not advancing. Now we see uh, the whole picture. Okay. Do you see it now? We see a border wall primer nomenclature and field marks. Okay, this is the opening slide. Do you see that now? No. No. Hmm. Miles, would you like me to do the advocacy piece first and then you can fix it? Sure. Yeah, I don't. It's um, odd because it says uh, that I am sharing here. So do you see me now? Yes. Okay. Please. Let me do the share screen. Okay. And um, and there should be a PowerPoint presentation in front of you. Yes. You uh -huh. See that? All the different pictures. And the, there's the opening slide. Yeah. Okay. And you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now we're seeing that. Yeah. Now we're seeing it. So, yeah, there was some issue here with this. Um, anyway, so we're at. As I was saying, there's been um, most of the border has been walled off in Arizona, New Mexico, and California, and um, and there's but when you when people talk about the border wall, um, they talk about pedestrian fencing, vehicle fencing, and replacement fencing, and so that's something that I wanted to focus on here. And um, now I'm going to enlarge in the screen here, and if it goes back to the same thing. I'll just go back to that. And sorry that it's a smaller um, picture there. 
but um, mm -hmm. is it full screen now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you see the uh, there's a table there that says pedestrian vehicle. Yeah. Okay. And do you see the next slide? Not yet. No. Okay. So we're going to go back to this and we're going to stay on this one now. Um, okay. There we go. So um, there's a, a cartoon here that an artist Robert Crumb from the 60s did, and it's called A Short History of America. And you'll see that it's a sequential chrono chronology of what happens to our land. We have this nice meadow in the Great Plains and some trees, and then finally a little cabin is built, and then the road comes by, and then next thing you know, power lines uh, arrive, and then you have freeways and street lights, and pretty soon a dilapidated city. And, um, and that's essentially kind of what we're seeing in the borderlands and it's, it's quite unfortunate. So I'll go through the first border markers here, which um, people mentioned earlier, but in, uh, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1849, they established about 50 monuments. And here's one of the original ones in the San Rafael Valley that you'll see in the upper left-hand corner. So they were just small little markers. And then uh, about 40 years later, uh, after they did the boundary survey, they established the obelisks. And uh, monument number one is in Sunland Park, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And that is um, it, uh, near El Paso, right on the Rio Grande. And then it ends with monument 258, which is um, uh, on the beach at Tijuana, San Diego by Friendship Park. Mm -hmm. And all the obelisks are um, different styles and shapes. Some are metal, some are concrete, some are small, some are quite large. But you'll see here in the San Rafael Valley, there's a, a little bit of, um, there's barbed wire like there is pretty much everywhere. And then you'll see the, the first vehicle barriers went up where they just took you know old railroad track material and just kind of haphazardly strung this together. And then they put up some mesh there um, as if, you know, that was really going to keep people out. And, um, and then over uh, when you get into Western Arizona and San Diego, they started using Vietnam era landing mat um, from the 60s and 70s and used that as border barrier. And then they put the razor wire at the top. And, um, and then in other places, they have uh, different styles of vehicle barrier. There's bollard vehicle barrier and then the Norman defense, like you'd see uh, Omaha Beach. And so this picture on the lower right-hand corner shows those two styles coming together. Um, the one on the right is at San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge. And they built that to be as wildlife friendly as possible. Uh, and then DHS came in and put the Normandy barrier, which is unfortunate because larger animals like pronghorn or in the boot heel bison, uh, they can't make it over this very easily. Um, that's a pretty long jump to jump a meter high and clear that space as well. Whereas the bollard pedestrian fencing is a little easier for most wildlife to get through. Mm -hmm. And then of course, down here in the lower middle, you see the 30 foot fence, which is in uh, New Mexico. And then there are surveillance towers, electronic surveillance towers that are all along the border and which have been very effective. And in fact, the Border Patrol was reporting that the, the, that was the real game changer. And prior to Trump being elected, even Brandon Judd of the Border Patrol Union, which is not a real union, um, said, oh, we don't need a border wall. We need more of this. Now let's get into replacement fencing because this was what we heard on the news, much to the frustration of many of us in the border wall fight. Um, they would say, oh, President Trump has, hasn't built one mile of new border wall. It's all been replacement fencing. So on the left in 2018 is the vehicle fencing, the D-Day type barrier, which, you know, a lot of animals can still get through. A mountain lion could scurry underneath there. It's not an impenetrable barrier. But then a couple of years later, we now have the 30-foot bollard wall fencing, which, as we all know, is impenetrable. So here's a photograph taken from roughly the same spot, um, but the one on the left, I used a telephoto so I could see the destruction of Guadalupe Canyon in the background. That's what those mine tailings are that you see. Um, they've installed about 400, 500 watt lights along there and an all weather road, uh, which gives everybody access to places that were formerly generally inaccessible. 
<clears throat> and if, as was mentioned earlier, there's only four inch gaps between the bollards. So you can see up here, the former obelisk or is, is, um, is cut off now. Um, this one you see on the right, that's the corner of the boot heel, the northwest uh, place where the east-west axis of the state meets the north-south running one. So that's Monument 40. And um, I always wanted to visit that. And uh, back in April, I managed to get out there. So um, somebody showed me this picture, says, well, see, the, the bears, they can get over it. Well, you know, I think anybody who knows animals can look at that poor bear and uh, it doesn't look very happy. Um, and what the fate of it was after that is, remains to be seen. Um, this was near Naco. Um, you can see where the pole says uh, 46. That's Bisbee, Warren in the background there. And I went down to find this site and it turns out that it was in between the primary and secondary barriers. And so primary means that's the first line of scrimmage because you know we apply sports metaphors and policy to all of our, uh, basically our, our foreign and domestic policies here in America. That's as, that seems to be as good as we can do is use football analogies. And then the second line of scrimmage, I guess you would call this the safety if you're a football fan, um, is the secondary barrier. And uh, they are, uh, placing these in a lot of urban areas. So there's essentially this no man's land like you would find in the DMZ of North Korea, um, the former Berlin Wall, but these are in our country, in our borderlands to um, keep out the most impoverished, persecuted people in the hemisphere. And it turns out a border patrol agent took this picture. Hmm. And um, it first circulated around social media in Mexico and in, was in El Imparcial and some other papers in Sonora. And so when I went to find this, because I saw that the light post was labeled, I thought that'd be pretty easy to find it. Um, I encountered the agent who actually took the picture and he had no idea that it had circulated through there. So as far as wildlife uh, is concerned, um, the border wall is going to really limit the recovery of some species such as the Mexican gray wolf. Now here we are in Eastern New Mexico, uh, Central Eastern, and this is uh, where they have built um, a complete bollard wall, 100 miles long, 99 miles long across the east-west axis. So back in 2017, a Mexican gray wolf from Chihuahua, who was part of the recovery program, that was wearing a GPS satellite collar made a 600 mile journey over a 32 day period. And it spent three days in the US. So it crossed where there is now a, an impenetrable border wall. It spent a couple of days in Las Cruces, right downtown, came down the Rio Grande, spent a little while in Sunland Park and then on Mount Cristo El Rey for a little while before it went back south and returned to its home in the mountains of Chihuahua. This Mount Cristo El Rey is where the We Build the Wall built their private border wall on Memorial Day weekend of two, two I think two or three years ago, um, 2019. And uh, so now uh, it would be quite difficult for this wolf to cross into the US and to cross out of it. Other species that are affected are the peninsular bighorn sheep. This is in California in the Hakumba wilderness. The peninsular desert bighorn sheep is a subspecies of our desert bighorn and it occurs in a fairly restricted area of southeastern California and going down into Baja. Um, this is uh, another example of GPS collared animals that they have thousands of points showing that they cross the international border going back and forth. But the border wall of course uh, threatens to sever that movement. Here is the Hakumba Wilderness, uh, and this is a place called Davies Valley. So the date on this is January of 2020. And so in the last year of the Trump administration, and when I talked to foremen working for Southwest Valley constructors that said, we need to have this done by election day, which seems a rather odd date for a, the largest public works project in American history in modern times to have an arbitrary November 3rd uh, finish date. Um, over that year, they managed to put a 30-foot border wall across where these desert bighorn sheep call their home. 
So we'll see, they, they fast track this through here at the expense of all environmental safety, review, engineering best practices, and of course the impact to wildlife. This is San Bernardino National Wildlife Refuge in 2018, drone photograph of a pond called Robertson Cienega. So you'll see on the left, there is the vehicle barrier, fairly permeable to wildlife. And here's this nice pond that harbors the native Rio Yaqui fishes, which include the Yaqui catfish, the only catfish native to the Western slope of North America, the Yaqui top minnow, the Yaqui chub, and the beautiful shiner, along with several other species of uh, fish that are endemic to this area. So this is what it looks like now. The excessive groundwater pumping in order to mix the concrete has uh, diminished the flow of the artesian wells on the wildlife refuge. These artesian wells have flowed for thousands of years under their own pressure. They're slightly warm to the touch around 80 degrees and uh, they've flowed with that fail ever since uh, at least Western humans have been in existence on this land. In the background is the Slaughter Ranch, which is a historical monument and museum. Um, so it's been settled for quite a while, but now they've had to install solar powered pumps in order to keep a moderate flow uh, going so that uh, the rest of the ponds don't dry up. But they basically had to perform triage on this pond so that the fish would survive. You'll see on the left, there's the 30 foot border wall along with the associated stadium lighting that stretches from Guadalupe Canyon to Coronado National Memorial. So there is a 70 mile stretch of impenetrable border that runs right through jaguar critical habitat, national forests and wilderness areas. Now you've seen this um, earlier presenters, um, Emily, Sue and, and Roz were showing this location. This is the Western slope of the Patagonia Mountains. And this is in the Coronado National Forest. Now, of course, most people think of a forest as having trees, but um, there are trees there, they're called mesquites. Um, but um, the width of destruction that they, that they carved up this mountain was just uh, beyond what they should have done. Um, it's supposed to be a 60 mile wide strip on the Roosevelt easement. But as uh, Roz mentioned earlier, and in fact, you can see somebody carrying a measuring tape uh, down there. I think that's maybe Sue carrying that. Um, we measured about 110 feet in this area. So um, Fisher Sand and Gravel was by far the most lawless of all of the contractors and they're still hanging around and I would like to serve them with an eviction order uh, if I can get enough people. It, uh, more pictures of the just the mess and destruction that they left. There's piles of steel and rebar. Um, they've bulldozed over water courses. Uh, what's going to be, you know, the fate of that when things come around? Um, there's no other construction site in the country you'd probably be able to get away with these type of practices. And, um, and there's a good reason for that. It's because they don't have to comply with any laws. And I'll get to that in a little bit. This is looking from Coronado National Memorial back to the east towards the San Bernardino Valley and Guadalupe Canyon. So there's that 70 mile border wall. Nothing can pass through there larger than a cottontail. Looking east towards Coronado National Memorial. I know you've seen these pictures because Roz was showing those earlier, but, um, but there it is a, a drone image. Uh, up to the right, you see the orphan wall. Um, that's been a term used, I, I like that term here. Uh, and then the former vehicle fence running up there. So, you know, this is Mexico on the right. And, um, and it's interesting that everybody was always disparaging Mexico for their land use. And I think that um, the malpractice of, of land use in Mexico is usually just by just neglect and just whatever's in the way. But what we're doing here is by design. And um, when you are inflicting this much damage upon the land by design, um, I think that's kind of the definition of evil and crime. And this takes it to a whole new level. This was where they had the encounter with the security guard and another Fisher Sand and Gravel site that looks to me like um, places I've been in Globe where at least they're mining for copper so that we have some use that comes out of uh, the destruction. And um, in those cases, they have to comply with the Endangered Species Act, the Water Act, and jump through a lot of hoops including things like NEPA 
in order to get to the point of uh, whatever land use is going to happen. But with this, they don't have to comply with anything. And the reason is because in 2005, the Real ID Act was passed. And in Section 102, it allows the Secretary of Homeland Security, who is an unelected, uh, a politically appointed official, to waive all of these laws dating back to 1890. Um, it's, it's quite shocking um, because there were four acting secretaries, including the last one, Chad Wolf. So they were not even confirmed by Congress, but it's just anybody could be acting in this position and sign away laws act, enacted by both houses of Congress, signed into law by the president and surviving a century of judicial review. So um, this is not a complete list of these, um, but Pick your favorite act out there, and I'm sure you'll find that, and you'll be shocked that uh, the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act can be waived, and the uh, Antiquities Act, etc. And this all can occur in a 100-mile zone along the U.S. border. So um, about 80% of the population lives of humans live within this area, and. Um, there's a lot of federal and state lands that they can inflict this damage upon. So here's that 100 mile zone in our neck of the woods. And you'll see that uh, everything on here that has a color to it, with the exception of the light yellow, um, is subject to this potential destruction if they wanted to do that. So, People act, ask, you know, what can you do? Um, apply pressure to your, your elected officials, um, write letters. Um, this is not going away. Um, last week, Governor Greg Abbott of Texas said that they are going to build their border wall. Uh, Governor Rick DeSantis of Florida has sent his sheriffs to Arizona. Uh, they're trying to rally this group of these right-wing extreme governors who, um, if you dial back to about 1862, this looks like sedition to me. So um, uh, keep very vigilant because we're in very dangerous times. And, and this border wall has become a symbol of, uh, you know, tribalism for uh, just, you know, hatred and racism. And there's no regard for the land or the people. And um, we need to really apply enough pressure so that when they get back in power, they don't roll through the rest of it because I guarantee you that they are gonna run through this and, uh, and, and blast away the rest of our borderlands. So thank you all for your commitment here and, um, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions you have. Thank, thank you, Miles. That, that's um, very informative and very important. Um, I think we're going to hear from Sally first and then have a Q&A and anybody can direct your question directly to Miles or Kate or anybody. Um, and also uh, you could write it in the chat and Sally will be monitoring that. So, uh, so let's hear from Sally. Okay, so thank you for hanging out with us and taking, um, just really being with us today. Um, I want to show the slideshow. So I'm gonna talk about the beginning. So when you come to a broad um, webinar, you know you always have some homework. So we're gonna give you some specific ideas for this next week and then on through a couple of weeks from now. So what can we do now advocacy for this week? Um, here it is. First one is call members of Congress. And I'll tell you how to do that and what to do in, with that in a minute. And the second one is to write letters to the editor. And we'll talk about that. So let's get into it. The first thing is make calls this week. The Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill fiscal year 2022 is coming up for markup in the House in a couple of weeks. And in the Senate after that. So we want to call the members of the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Homeland Security and the members of the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Homeland Security. And, and then if you have time, we'll, we'll um, give you the list and you can call others as well. So in your phone calls, which will be really quick, they take like 
maybe even less than a minute or two minutes, you just want to talk to the person in, in the office, you want to hear some talking points. So following should not be included in the fiscal year 2022 Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill. No new funding for border wall or barriers and rescind any of the remaining and all previously appointed funding for the construction of border wall, border barriers and related infrastructure. And can you transfer funding from the Department of Homeland Security, including any unobligated border wall construction funding to the Department of the Interior and other agencies with expertise in environmental conservation and mitigation so that they can begin remediation and restoration efforts. We want to transfer that money from one agency to another because the Department of Interior knows how to, how to remediate the damage. Then I give you a sample script here. Hi, my name is Sally Sharp and I live in Durango. I'm calling you today to you know, it gives you the sample script and it's super, super short. These calls will just take a minute or two. And please just, you know, we ask you to spend about a half an hour doing this. It's, it's, you're probably talking to an intern or leaving a message, um, but do it because your voice counts and we're working with conservation partners on this. So a couple of things, also important points to keep in mind, you may get pushback on your phone calls. You need to plan for it. Examples may include, you are not a constituent. Well, of course you're a constituent because this is a border wall in the whole country. And these folks are representing the constituents of this country when they're on this committee. And then you may hear that we have already rescinded the Department of Defense border wall funding. Um, and that is true, but there's other border wall funding that has been congressionally appropriated from 2017 to 2020 that's still in effect. And we want everything rescinded. And then please, please, please email me to report your actions. We are working with coalition partners to, to really make this a big, a big push. So please. Um, and then the next one is to um, write letters to the editor that we want to thank the Biden administration for the Department of Homeland Security plan that was released on June 11, 2021. And it's my understanding is that it's pretty much a good thing and everything we want. So we want to write letters in support of this um, to the editor. And that means letters across the country. We just don't want to hear from people from Arizona. We want to hear from everyone. So here's what you write. In the, so we want to talk about what's in the plan. So in the plan, the Department of Homeland Security, they um, talk about what's previously they've been directed. Um, they've been previously directed to cancel the wall projects, to end wall expansion, and to address safety and environmental issues re resulting from the border wall construction. So that's already happening. Um, what's new is this. Oops, sorry. So Department of Homeland, Secur Homeland Security will engage in a comprehensive review. They want to detail the analysis of environmental impacts and then they're going to engage. They're planning to engage robust engagement with relevant stakeholders, which is new because they've done this kind of thing without communicating with anyone. So they want to talk to the border community residents, the tribal communities, environmental organizations, and other activists. And this is what they're saying that we're doing. So we're gonna say, thank you, thank you, thank you. We like, we like this. Um, so here's their talking points. Give kudos and thank you, thanks to the administration for planning the, for remediation of environmental damage and tell why this is important to you Make it personal, like you can tell them you saw this webinar or if you happen, happen to go to the webinar, like on our broad walk, our broad work, um, tell about it and then state the expectation for strong progress towards this goal. And then I give you a sample. So here's the sample. This is from the Defenders of Wildlife. So we applaud the Biden administration for taking this important action to stop continuing harm caused by the border wall. 
the reversal of funding and halt of construction projects are great steps, but there is still hard work ahead. We are optimistic that the administration will address the significant safety and environmental challenges and call on Congress to provide the funding required to repair the devastating damage. Defenders of Wildlife looks forward to seeing reconnected communities of both people and wildlife along the southern border soon. So we just ask you to do those two things and shoot me an email back. And that's, that's our ask. And thank you so much for listening. And now we can take some questions. So if you have questions in the chat, we can talk. Yeah. You can raise your hand or put it in the chat or just speak up. So Jackie asked, how are we to remember all of this information? I am going, so this webinar is being recorded and then I will send everybody on the list um, the presentation that I just presented along with lists and phone numbers of the members of the committees of in the House the House members and the Senate members of those committees. Okay. Um, huh. You're so quiet. I Well, I see in the chat, oh, there's a direct message. Is the water in the swimming pool safe to drink or swim in? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would hope it is safe to drink, but who knows what might have been mixed with it to in, in order to use it for construction. So um, if an animal does drink it, could that be dangerous? Possibly. I don't know. Does Miles maybe, do yeah, you know? I can, I can speak to that. So um, I, on that image there, you can't see it, but there's a wellhead that's right next to it. So that's a place where they had drilled a well and um, what they do is they put a lot of water in that so that trucks can come and pump up and fill up the water trucks while the well keeps on going. And so mm -hmm. the, the well can't keep up with filling up the trucks all day long. So they have this reservoir mm -hmm. that they have there. They have it fenced off um, because it's lined with that um, plastic liner. And if something slipped into there, it may not be able to get out very well because it's it's really slippery on those steep sides. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's really unfortunate that here in this time of drought and everything's so dry and the streams aren't running that there's no, no attention paid to saying, what can we do to at least install a drinker here? That would be a no brainer, you know, in mm -hmm. two or three hours, uh, I'm sure there are a group of us that would be able to go down there, install a solar powered pump, put a little, toilets, nozzle there, float valve, and, and at least supply the animals, because that is good water. It's come, it came straight out of the ground. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not a toxic waste dump or anything. It's just mm -hmm. getting dirty now. Hey, Miles, Miles, I'm wondering with the work you've done so far, what are you and other groups advocating in terms of specific areas? Have you got a plan to give to the administration yet, or is it still in progress? We've been providing them restoration reports. And so, for example, the really extreme site that you saw with all the construction equipment, um, mm -hmm. that was one of the first reports we did because as well as the Patagonia Mountains. And so we have a template that we developed which shows the location, the latitude, longitude, uh, what project it was, whether it's a specific point or if it's a long stretch that they need to look at and what the hazards are, whether it's erosion, whether it's, you know, a public uh, wildlife safety health issue like that one that you saw and, um, and a timeline for when these actions need to take place. So we have given um, about a half dozen of these to okay. the administration and um, a couple of weeks ago, they reached out to us and we had a, a meeting, Zoom meeting with DHS personnel and um, people I was quite familiar with. And so it's really pleasantly surprising uh, how things have really turned around. And I believe that there is a sincere effort. You know, you've always got to 
you know, trust but verify. But um, but I, I think we're on the right track, and the information that they provided so far seems like they want to do the right thing. So, if there are places that you uh, see along the border, you know, document that just like you've been doing. Make sure you've got your coordinates correct and and present it in a in a good fashion. But um, I'd be happy to help out with that if people have um, places that they'd like to get uh, up the pipe. You know, we have a, a sort of a conduit now, so I'd be happy to help out with that. That's great. Thanks. Miles, I have a I have a, a comment, kind of a comment question. Um, if it the most one of the most powerful things you showed, and I've worked with you, and I've never seen this, was a slide that actually listed all of the environmental laws that have been waived. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that the the Bald Eagle Act uh, Protection Act was waived, it you know it even got to me, and I you know and I've been hearing about this stuff, so. I think I think that slide was very powerful, and it, it I'd love for you to share it with more people. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Yeah. Yeah. That that's not a full list either. Um, they, they added more to it, and for some reason they they seem to have this ability to add and waive more laws that weren't even part of the Real ID Act. So that <laughs> that's a lack of Congress. That's a, a failure of Congress's wisdom to give away that much power to unelected officials and uh -huh. uh, the DHS and the executive branch. Yeah. Uh, it says pockets. You had your hand up. Can you speak? Go ahead. Yeah. And actually, my name is Lynn Conan, and I live in California. And I have friends who actually work with immigration on our border, but not with the border wall in this respect. So I'm so impressed with this. I would actually like to know if it's possible to get the um, PowerPoint presentations, because I want to share this with a couple of my friends that are doing things and and travel to Arizona and that sort of thing. Yeah. And where I can do these kinds of things myself. And I know there's being recorded, but that's not the same thing as having the PowerPoint kinds of things, because they're both really powerful, both of them that I saw. Good. Well, Thanks. yeah, Sally has the um, presentation and it is rather large, so it's hard to email. Oh, right. but, um, Maybe I, I can maybe find a way to get it smaller and then uh, send it out. Um, let me work on that. Otherwise, we can do something called WeTransfer that uh, it works pretty well. You just have to download it from that. So, yeah. I have to know how to do that too. <laughs> yeah, I know. We can give instructions. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, if you print it out, I will uh, pay to have it sent to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> at least look at it that way, you know, wow. like online kind of thing, because sometimes those kinds of things work too. So, but yeah. anyway, I'm just so impressed with all of the work that you all have done. I'm just, wow. I love it. Thank you. No, thank, thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm. And then Jackie had her hand up. So, so I see the need for this done on the Tijuana, San Diego border as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the border with Texas that all this documentation and, uh, needs to be collected into one, um, into, into one document and send to those uh, subcommittee uh, members. So, um, but um, what is the, I guess my question is, is what's the possibility, Miles, of actually doing this in the San Diego Tijuana border? I know uh, from being working in Friendship Park for a while last summer that um, the need is great, especially at Otay, um, wilderness area. Yeah, they're working on OTI. And in fact, there were two locations that were specified in the DHS Biden administration um, document. And that was the OTI Mesa wilderness and the lower Rio Grande Valley of Texas to repair the levee damages there. So sure, I, that's, that's getting a lot of love. Um, so uh, we're, we're happy to see that, but there's going to be a lot of places along the border. So it's, a, it's up to the people who live there to find out what's relevant to document what's been uh, destroyed because some people may not see that. Um, we finished just uh, recently mapping the U or mapping the Arizona and New Mexico border wall and documenting the destruction on there and uh, prioritizing the, the crucial sites. Um, but definitely California and Texas uh, need some of this thorough work done. Yeah. 
Yeah, we need to organize perhaps with uh, broadband leaders there. So, yeah. And Kate, do you know if you're still there, Kate, do you know if the Berkeley group, are they making their information available back to us here or to the feds or what are they gonna do with it? These are smart guys and gals. What are they gonna do with this stuff? They're preparing a, a pre presentation for both congressional people for um, and then a separate one for people like the Corps of Engineers, more um, of the people that needed to be sharing this information uh, with the communities when they were doing it, because there's some information that I'm not at liberty to say that we, we, we <laughs> you know, there's going to be some very serious presentations done um, and they're working them up very quickly. We'll have them I would guess um, by the end of this month, because that is why they came pre-monsoon. That was the critical endeavor that needed to be, so we have the baseline to say, okay, we have the 3D drone photogrammetry that you saw Scott Walls doing at the Pajarito Mountain and he did it in Guadalupe Canyon. So we have this 3D topo imagery of the border wall construction and you have analysis sites set up so that they will have this data and they'll say, see, this is what we have. And these are what we're, these are our concerns and why we need to take action now. And that was my, my whole, you know, modus operandi to get them here. And they're very, very committed, talented people. And yes, they're, they are going to be on the ground coming back and continuing this work. It's not, this was not a one-off, you know, them just coming. This is true scientific analysis. Yeah. And it and sounds like they're level. in agreement with some of our really naive eyeball, this is crazy engineering. It sounds like that's what they're proving that it environmentally engineered badly, you know. In yeah, many they, I would say the word stunned is something that if anyone, <laughs> I mean, Miles said it in a video that a good friend of ours, Leslie Epperson did for him to uh, get this started about the the savagery of what they've done to our borderlands. And it's like he said, I wish everybody could see this because when you see it, it's just nothing, as you know, you yeah. go there and you just, I mean, I, I get chills and I wanna just go crazy thinking about it right now. And it, 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 it haunts you. And so if, if people like when Sally was saying that constituent, yes, this is your land, okay? We're just here being stewards and trying to tell everybody, look at what's happening, look at what's happening. So the more people are saying, what is going on down there? And you know, this, I won't even get into the political fracas that our leaders are doing to us to undermine us. But so yeah, we, we need, you know, so when you have outside, I mean, these people, you know, living in San Francisco, they're coming here. And so I'm saying, hey, you know, get more, get more people uh, from all different parts of the country involved in this. Cause it's affects, it affects us. So anyway, I was a long winded yeah. answer, but you know me, I get kind yeah. of worked up about this. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. We're so, glad you're there. We're glad you're both there. Yeah. Thank Great. you. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, I think we need to probably bring this to there a close. There's a couple in the chat, Emily. I I think there was some in the chat. Okay, um, let's see here. I think there's, okay, so it says, will there be any follow-up work to see the potential impact of this year's monsoons? And I think that should be our last question. Yeah. Uh, I think there well, are, will be, yeah. Yeah, that, I think I've had to address that. They, they, they set up their baseline points of reference and they did want to go to um, points further west, uh, like Quito, Bikito, and other areas, but they couldn't work that in. So as subsequent trips will involve other um, setting up of analysis points uh, reference, so they know. Um, but yes, it's ongoing. They will continue. I guess that was the question. Will it yeah. continue? Yeah, okay. And Miles, you will do the same, I take it? You're gonna look at as many sites as you can? 
post monsoon. I hope everything just goes to plan. No, um, my, <laughs> my background was as a range ecologist and that was uh, doing monitoring plots and paired photos. So by default, I'm always establishing baseline everywhere I go. So yeah. um, I've been doing that all along. And, and I started doing that before some border wall construction. Uh, when they were announcing this, I thought, oh, I better get some photo points in there and fly the drone and do some stuff like that. And a guy named John Kirk is doing a lot of that as well. So there's a group of us who are paying attention and um, mm -hmm. we're waiting for the monsoon. And in fact, it's coming in right now here in Tucson, it is. seeing signs yeah. of it. So uh, yeah. hopefully we'll it'll be a good one. Yeah. yeah, well, stay cool. And we're so glad you're there. Better you than us right now in that heat. Thank you. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, if there's one word of advice I could give, if you buy a new MacBook computer, uh, don't go cheap and not go for the Microsoft software. A friend of mine says, <laughs> oh, just do this. It works great. It's just like the other one. Uh, as you can see, you know, it didn't play well with Zoom. So sorry okay. about that. Yeah. <laughs> Zoom is its own thing. There's so a trick Sally, to it. Sally, I have a question for Sally. Uh, will this, will this, uh, can you uh, tell us how this presentation will be available uh, after today for people that missed it? Sure. So I'm going to send out an email tomorrow to everyone who signed up and include um, all of the presentations that I can. And if I have Miles' permission, I would like to include that one too. Um, and and the one with Emily, the one that Emily made is too long. So we can't include that, but that is part of the, the, the recording. And I will send the recording and it's on Facebook and send every, all the information that belongs with the advocacy piece along as well. So there will be a hefty email in your inbox tomorrow. Thanks. Excuse me, but why can't you just uh, turn it into a YouTube video, upload it, and then send us all a link? Um, I can do that. Great, thanks. Okay, good. Yeah. So uh, everyone, that, that, everyone that registered is going to get that link? Yep. Okay. Cool. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, I would like to leave us with a quote, or actually a paraphrase, of um, an indigenous um, woman that I heard in a webinar a few months ago. It is Diana Sue Ukwala, and she is a Havasupai Nation, third generation tribal and traditional leader who is a practicing and ceremonialist recognized for her intuitive abilities. And she sounded from phenomenal. I don't know her. Um, I'm just paraphrasing one thing she said in this webinar which was basically, don't give up. We can bring balance and get along with each other. We need repetition to say, don't do bad things. Tell Mother Earth that we still love her. Change the way we make money so that we can sustain life. And with that, I would like to just say thank you for all coming and thank you for our speakers and um, we will keep in touch. Thanks guys. Okay. Thank you everybody. Thanks. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks. Mm.